So hi everyone, I'm Dan Gosling. I'm Principal Legal Record Specialist at the National Archives UK and I specialise in the records created and received by the Central Law Courts of England and Wales from the medieval period all the way up to the creation of the Supreme Court of Judicature in the 19th century. When I'm giving workshops I always say that legal records and the law don't really care about these periodizations of medieval early modern because it sort of just stays the same from about 1200 up to about 1875. So I cover that period, a few centuries or so. Um, so today I'm going to very briefly chat about the collections that we hold at the National Archives and then how I use those collections for my own research. I'll try and keep my presentations as brief as possible to allow for questions and I can elaborate further on anything I say uh, at the end. So hopefully the slide has moved across. Um, so the National Archives is the central repository for the government, but it's also the repository for the central court records, the, the legal system in England and Wales. Um, and even though we're the National Archives UK, when we're talking about legal systems, we are largely talking certainly before 1700 about England and Wales, but even after that, um, and as Fergus is going to talk about a little bit, um, the sort of the Scottish legal records um, stayed in Scotland and remained in Scotland. Um, so what we have at National Archives uh, UK are predominantly records created by those legal systems that were operating in England and Wales. But that includes several legal systems like the common law, the equity systems, the ship, the courts of chivalry and all of those central law courts. Um, and when I say central law courts, it's these ones that are based around Westminster or were based around Westminster, Westminster Hall. The image um, on the slide here is actually from History of Parliament's website. And it's a selection of the courts from the 17th century. So you can see Westminster Hall, which in the hall itself has the Court of Chancery, King's Bench and Common Pleas. And then just adjacent, we have Exchequer, Exchequer Chamber, um, Court of Wards behind, Star Chamber is just out of shot on the south bound by the river. Um, so all of these courts are operating in Westminster and Westminster Hall. So when I'm talking about central law courts, that's generally what I am referring to. But it's not just London, um, as as Helen was mentioning in the last session, uh, even the National Archives has quite a, a local sort of focus. Um, a lot of these cases originated in counties and it's just central in terms of the legal system gone up through the courts to these central courts. So there is a lot for the local historian in these central law courts, not just for uh, London and Westminster. And I mean, this is just a selection of slides of, of some legal records we hold at National Archives. Um, so for everything from plea rolls, controlment rolls, the one in the middle is writs from the Court of Star Chamber. Uh, on the right, it's um, an initial, a title rochelet from Mary the First's reign for the Court of Queen's Bench. Uh, these are Star Chamber depositions and bills. These are, this is an indenture. Um, from I think this one's Henrietta Maria and Charles the Sec, uh, Charles the First's widow, um, and deeds themselves aren't usually sort of central court records, but they are when they get brought in to the central courts as part of deeds and evidences. Uh, on the right hand side, these are printed criminal proceedings. Um, they're from the Privy Council, um, sort of the overseas colonial appeals. And we have the assizes they were mentioned in the previous session um, because in terms of itinerant justice, what we hold here at the National Archives are the assize material because those are the Crown Justices on circuit and they go on circuit and they bring their records back to the centre. But then you get things like the petty sessions, the quarter sessions, which are sort of that one step down from that justice system and those records are held at local archives. So one sort of general comment when we're talking about National Archives, when we think about legal systems, it's not just one archive. And I think that was mentioned in the previous session. Um, when you're considering things like where a case was heard, you may want to look at both a local record office and the National Archives to fully trace the development of a case or the types of offence that are being committed. And yet what we have on the slide here on the left hand side is a minute book um, from the Hampshire Lent Circuit. And then on the right hand side, it's some assized depositions. And then we go, we go all the way up here at National Archives to treason records um, and the records on the slide here are from the Bag of Secrets series, one of my favourite series, because the records were physically kept in these leather bags on the left and the document on the right is a commission empowering um, the judge in a treason trial, I 
I forget exactly which one. I think this is Thomas Howard um, following the Rodolfi plot. And then this is just another treason record here. This is from the 1745 Jacobite Rebellion, and it's the prosecution of 700 individuals for the uprising in the 18th century. And now all the treason records fill that. So the collection at the UK National Archives is vast. Um, I've, I've started telling people that it's the lar largest archive for legal records in the world. I think it's true. It's very difficult to disprove. Um, but it's because we have the benefit of a millennia of a centralised justice system and one single archive for it. Because on the continent, these sorts of records are usually split up. So things like the Vatican Archive, which has as long a say, legal jurisdiction, their archives are split up in different bits. So we probably have the largest archive of its type in the world. Um, so people starting to research these records, it can be very daunting. There are lots of barriers to research using these records. Um, you can see one of the barriers here on the slide in terms of description and cataloging. Um, there are hundreds of thousands, if not millions of individual cases coming through these law courts over the centuries. But in terms of cataloging, sometimes all we have is, so the image on the right here is a King's Bench plea roll. Um, it describes which term it is. Um, it describes which regnal year it is. And that's all you've got. You need to go into index books to actually find the individual cases. Uh, on the left, it's exchequer equity bills and answers. And again, it's only described on the catalogue by county. And sometimes you get item number and year. And you have to use physical paper calendars to narrow that down if you're lucky. Sometimes even those don't exist and you just need to dive into them and see what you can find. One thing I will shout about is part of my job and part of the job that my team does is try and get these catalogue descriptions a bit better so you can search for things. So this this actually came on the catalogue this week, um, which is one of the reasons I've shown it today. Um, it's exchequer depositions for George III's reign um, that we've used calendars which are held up in the map room and just put all of that into the catalogue. So that's not one of the ongoing projects we're doing just to make things a bit easier to search on the catalogue. Uh, very generally, just some notes on arrangement of legal records at the National Archives when you're looking for them. They're arranged by court or record creator, so KB for King's Bench or Queen's Bench, uh, CP for Common Pleas, E for the courts um, operating out of the Exchequer, Stack is Star Chamber, and then you get law courts which operate within larger government offices like Exchequer and Chancery, where there are divisions created in discovery. Description varies, and also Sometimes you're not just going to be looking in one series for all the records relating to one case. Often they're separated across several series. So the example here is uh, for the Court of Exchequer Equity because it's spread across E112, E1334, and then the Korean order books as well. Um, there are some other arrangements depending on like the type of case. So when I'm talking about divisions in discovery, this is what I mean. Um, the catalogue will have divisions if there's different types of records. So this is divisions within King's Bench where they're divided between crown side records and then police side records. And a lot of research guides and things have been written up to try and help you navigate those records. This is a blog that I wrote for Hampshire Archives Trust talking about exchequer disputes. Um, so I think this is being recorded um, or if not, the web link is there, or just search Hampshire Archives Trust. And that's just using a single case from Exchequer to show how you uh, cut across. Um, but I'm happy to ask questions about that in the question afterwards. I'm just going to talk very briefly about some of the research projects I've been doing off the back of uh, the work I do in National Archives. This first one um, is about uh, the Southwark Bear Garden, the Bear Garden in Southwark um, in the Elizabethan Jacobean period. And this research stemmed from a cataloging project I was doing to put uh, the, what you can see on the slide here, are the old paper indexes and lists for ancient deeds. Um, so those are deeds that were received by the central government offices, either as part of litigation, or if they've just brought in um, for proof and then just left in those government offices. And then they got catalogued and calendared in the 19th century. Um, but never made it onto the online catalogue until about two years ago when we did a cataloging project to get that on. And in one of these uh, catalogues, the image on the right, you might be able to see the second from bottom entry um, says there's a list of bulls and bears. 
And when I was cataloging that, that intrigued me. So I thought I'd order it up and see what it was. It's exactly as described. It's a bear schedule, um, a schedule of all the bulls and bears and etc. that are kept in the bear garden in Southwark um, in the 1590s. And it was attached to this indenture because part of the indenture um, said you need to give these animals back or pay the cost of them at the end of the seven year lease. Um, so that led to me going down a bit of a rabbit hole for the last few years of sort of unpicking and seeing what other connected documents we held at the National Archives, why they were there and what they relate to. And I found sort of over 50 deeds relating to a specific area and all this area in the uh, Southern Bear Garden. And that's just using the calendar data and then also then the new catalogue data and searching for places for names and finding these connecting deeds. Um, I was very lucky with some of them that they all shared the same, um, they were all endorsed with the same person, Edward Allen, Thomas Mason, and Edward Allen was the theatre entrepreneur um, that operated in Southwark in the uh, early Jacobean, late Elizabethan, early Jacobean period. Um, so I got to talking with Dulwich Archives where his private papers are held, found more connecting documents to that, but then I also started connecting those deeds to our legal uh, collections at the National Archives, the court collections at the National Archives, um, because the reason that the deeds are probably here at the National Archives is because they've been brought in as part of litigation. And these are just some of the cases I found relating to this area, this dispute, and it, a lot of them relate to um, the will of Philip Henslow, another theatre owner, and his will is on the right hand side there, also at the National Archives brought in. Um, so it's just connecting, that project came out of a cataloging project and it was connecting the deeds to our court records, but also to uh, private collections in local archives. And then very briefly in the last minute or so, I'm just gonna talk about my most recent research, which again has come out um, of just, I think I found it when I was looking for something else completely different. And this one is all about the Chevalier Dayon in the Court of King's Bench. The Chevalier Dayon was a French spy and diplomat that lived in the late 18th and early 19th century. And they lived in England from uh, 1762 to 1777. And they're sort of a remarkable part of their story is in 1777, after living for 49 years as a man, they uh, transitioned to a woman and lived the rest of their 30, 40 years as a woman. They also were involved in a lot of legal disputes in England, in English court cases. And the biographers and all the academic works on Dayon mention this from newspaper reports. Um, and there's some of Dayon's private papers as mention it, but probably because I'm privileged to work where I am, whenever I see anyone talking about legal records or legal disputes, the first thing I do is to actually dive down into the records held at National Archives just to see what we hold, because more often than not, people haven't dug down to actually see what is there. And that's the case with the Chevalier Dale stuff, and I'm currently writing up a lot of this, um, these discoveries just to say what they are. So this is... Um, Dayon was prosecuted for libel in 1764. The indictment is that big central document um, there. And on the right, there is a copy of that indictment that is held in a King's Bench miscellaneous uh, collection. And this is another one where I kept sort of pulling the thread and found more and more stuff relating to it, including these affidavits relating to a later dispute. Um, you can see the signature of the Chevalier down at the top there. Um, on the right hand side, that's a copy of the newspaper of a libelous piece against the Chevalier Dayon, which is accusing Dayon of being a woman and refusing to acknowledge that the Chevalier is a man. Um, also included in these affidavits is a letter written by the Chevalier Dayon where they refer to themselves as both a man and a woman, and in fact get quite abusive to this Charles de Morand, who was involved in the libel case. Um, so that is where I'm going to stop my presentation, but it was just a very brief overview of our collections and what I've been doing with those collections in terms of my research. Thank you very much. Today I'm going to give a brief overview of some of the court records held by the National Records of Scotland. This is a vast topic and one for which I can barely scratch the surface in the available time. So I plan to give a short summary of the history and organisation of Scottish courts, briefly describe some of their records and outline a few of the projects I've worked on using them. 
I'll be happy to answer any questions either in the time after my paper or afterwards by email. The history of permanent courts in Scotland really dates back to about 1532 with the establishment of the College of Justice. This was the forerunner of what is now the Court of Session, the highest civil court in Scotland. Criminal cases continued to be heard by temporary courts until the Courts Act of 1672, which established the High Court of Justiciary. Um, this established the High Court as the highest criminal court in Scotland. It was based in Edinburgh, but it also met in three circuits. The Northern Circuit, sitting in Perth, Aberdeen and Inverness. The Western Circuit, sitting in Inverary, Stirling and Glasgow. And the Southern Circuit, sitting in Jedburgh, Dumfries and Ayr. When meeting in Edinburgh, the Just Justiciary Court was traditionally referred to as the High Court, but was known as the Circuit Court when travelling. One of the key provisions of the 1707 Treaty of Union was the preservation of Scots law, and Scotland has retained its distinctive legal system to the present day, albeit with changes over the centuries. One of the most significant changes came in the wake of the Jacobite Rising, with the Heritable Jurisdictions Act effectively abolishing franchise courts. These were local courts run by hereditary proprietors and traditionally held wide-ranging jurisdiction, both criminal and civil. The 18th century saw the gradual professionalisation of the sheriff courts around Scotland, with heritable sheriffs giving way to professional, legally trained sheriffs and other officials. This professionalisation continued into the 19th century, with the functions and jurisdictions of the sheriff courts expanding over time. In 1823, the powers of the commissary courts were, for the most part, transferred to sheriff courts. These involved the administration of inheritance matters and much of family law, including aliment and judicial separation, although jurisdiction over divorce was transferred to the court of session. Decisions of sheriff courts could be appealed to either the court of session or the high court as appropriate. And this is part of the reason why legal historians have tended to focus on the higher courts, as they were the courts that established legal precedents. In addition, court of sessions and, and high court records have generally been more accessible in the archive due to the existence of finding aids. There's something of a feedback loop here between historians and researchers concentrating on the higher courts and the archivists producing finding aids to support that demand. This is a shame, as the, the sheriff court records Sheriff courts collectively heard many more cases than the superior courts, and people were far more likely to appear in sheriff court records than in the High Court or the Court of Session. To give one example, between 1835 and 1899, the Circuit Court at Ayr tried 1,260 people, while Ayr Sheriff Court alone held solemn trials for twice as many, and just adding in Kilmarnock Sheriff Court brings that up to three times as many. By concentrating on the higher courts, researchers are missing a huge part of the ways in which ordinary people interacted with the law and the legal system as a whole. I mentioned finding aids. What examples are there? Well, some years ago, the, the NRS, the National Records of Scotland, embarked on a massive project to catalogue the justiciary court records. The major product of uh, this effort was the solemn database, so-called, as trials held before a jury are called solemn trials, uh, of 19th century justiciary court records. This brings together the records for around 55,000 cases heard by the justiciary court in the 19th century. The NRS has incorporated this, incorporated this data into its online catalogue on its website, and I'll share a link to the, the catalogue a little later. So what are the records? Well, one very useful aspect of Scots law is that courts have long relied on written evidence submitted in advance of trial. And this has resulted in a vast archival resource for researchers. For criminal cases in the High Court, the paper, usually, the paper trail usually begins with what is termed a precognition. This is the record of investigations carried out by the Procurator Fiscal, often simply referred to as the Fiscal, a Crown officer based locally who investigated reports of crimes by taking witness statements and gathering evidence, which was then submitted to the Crown Office. These preconditions are preserved by the NRS in series AD 14 and AD 15, as well as declarations, 
by the accused, by victims or by witnesses. They also often contain procedural documents, including, for example, petitions from the fiscal to court officers seeking a warrant to summon parties to the case or relevant correspondence. As such, they provide vital information as to how the courts actually operated in practice. The next set of records, often the most informative for individual cases, are referred to as the case papers for the High Court. These are JC26 series. Again, these often include um, administrative documents. Executions, not as dramatic as they actually sound, are in fact summons for individuals, the accused, but also for witnesses, to compare before the court on the appointed day of trial. Um, list of assize is a list of potential jurors from among whom the jury will be balloted. Diligences are what in other jurisdictions would be called summonses. Depositions are statements by the accused, often in response to cross-examination. The inventory is a list of documents and other items included in the case papers. You can think of it as a contemporary index to the records. The indictment, or in lower courts, such as the sheriff court and the criminal libel, uh, are formal statements, usually printed from the 18th century, of the allegations against the accused, including details of victims, the specifics of the offences, a list of witnesses, and sometimes a list of evidence to be produced. Productions are physical items to be produced in evidence. These are usually documents, letters, papers, certificates, and so on, but they can be absolutely anything. Famously, the NRS preserves a jar of arsenic and a block of poisoned chocolate used in evidence in the murder trial of Madeleine Smith. For obvious reasons, these are items are not generally produced for researchers. The records I've discussed thus far set out proceedings before the trial, but what of the trial itself? How can we know what happened in the courtroom? The most important record for this purpose are the minute books. These are organised separately for the High Court sitting in Edinburgh and for each of the circuits. The minute books don't generally give details of the charges or witness statements, but rather simply record each step of the proceedings in court. Each entry starts with the sederunt, giving the date, the location and the names of the judges. For much of the 19th century and earlier, the sederunts are written in Latin, but they're very formulaic and are very easy to, to follow. This is followed by a statement of the panel, as the accused are called in Scots, and his or her designation. The offence of which the panel was accused is then given, without any of the detail set out in the indictment. If the panel makes any submission to court, this fact is recorded and the indictment is read out to the panel. Any adjustments to the charges made by the prosecution are then outlined. The panel's plea is, is recorded and the procurators, legal representatives for the prosecution and the defence, are named. The assize, the jury, is then, is then named. Any witnesses are listed and the jury's verdict is recorded. The minute generally ends with either the panel being found not guilty and being assoiled, as the term has it, or if found guilty, sentenced. The minute books also contain similar details for appeals, either against convictions from lower courts or, in the Edinburgh minutes, against sentences imposed in the circuit courts. So the minute books often give fairly limited descriptions of proceedings in the courtroom itself. And this is where the final set of records come in, the books of a journal, as Marianne asked about in the introduction. Strictly speaking, these are not primary sources, as they were written up after the cases were heard. But where they exist, they can provide a very detailed description of proceedings from start to finish. The records for an individual case may, in some, may some, in some instances, run to hundreds of pages across multiple volumes spread over several years. The major drawback of the books of a journal is that before 1890, they were only created for the High Court sitting in Edinburgh. But where they do exist, they can provide a great deal of detail of the legal arguments deployed in court. The records of the Sheriff Court are in many ways similar, only less detailed and with worst rates of survival. I've already argued that the Sheriff Court records have been neglected by scholars, and, and this is a pity, as for 
social historians in particular, ordinary people were far more likely to appear in one row or another in the sheriff courts than in the justiciary court. As already mentioned, there were many more solemn trials heard in sheriff courts than in the justiciary court. And the sheriff courts also heard vast numbers of summary trials before a sheriff only, without a jury. To this day, Glasgow Sheriff Court apparently remains Europe's busiest criminal court. So historically, people's experience of the legal system was far more likely to involve the sheriff court than the justiciary court. That said, there are a range of reasons why um, why scholars have tended to neglect sheriff court records. Relatively patchy survival, less important cases, the court's inability to establish legal precedent and the lack of finding aids. Obviously, there's nothing to be done about the first three of those, but one project I've been working on in recent years is the creation of such finding aids. The first of these was to transcribe two very useful series of records held by the NRS, the Crown Council Procedure Books, AD 9, and the Crown Office Indexes of Cases, AD 8. The former is a basic list of cases referred upwards by fiscals to the Crown Office for consultation, and runs from 1822 to 1991, with a gap from 1879 to 1894. The latter is a similar but slightly more detailed record running from 1890 to 1944. For the first time, this index allows researchers to find cases of specific offences across the different levels of the Scottish judicial system. I produced this partly for my own purchase, uh, research purposes and partly, frankly, as a commercial venture, but I'm happy to provide access to the data set to bona fide scholars. The second finding aid I've been developing is an index to the Sheriff Court criminal records themselves. These are similar to the Justiciary Court records, albeit less detailed, and often combine minutes with criminal libels in a single volume, bringing together the details of the alleged offences and the outcomes of the trials themselves. I've so far digitised around 800 volumes of Sheriff Court criminal records and, and have indexed about 15,000 cases. I'm currently using both these indexes to work on two broader projects, researching two specific categories of offences. The first project, which is still in the very early stages, looks at offences under Section 5 of the rather innocuously named Criminal Law Amendment Act of 1885. Section 5, among other things, criminalised homosexuality in Scotland on a statutory basis. Using the AD8 and AD9 records, I've been able to find cases that were not actually brought to court and I found several instances where the authorities decided not to prosecute, provided the parties left the district. In the second project, I'm looking at prosecutions under the Registration of uh, Act of 50, 1854, which introduced statutory registration of births, deaths and marriages in Scotland the following year. It provided for surprisingly severe penalties for false registration, in theory up to two years in prison or up to seven years transportation in Australia. I've been working through the records of prosecutions under this Act, trying to determine a number of things. Who was prosecuted, why they provided false information, whether this false information was recorded in the Register of Corrected Entries, what sentences were, were imposed for those convicted and why. A project like this would be extremely challenging, if not virtually impossible, to carry out on a systematic basis without having access to the finding aids developed from AD8 and AD9. While a number of charges were brought under the Registration Act before the Justiciary Court, the vast majority were heard in the Sheriff Courts. As far as I can tell, despite the provisions of Section 60 and 62, nobody was ever actually sentenced to transportation for breaches of the Registration Act. But over 8,500 Scots were transported to Australia during the convict period. Another project I've been working on entailed linking the records of the Justiciary Court to the Australian transportation registers held at the National Archives in London. I've managed to do so in all but a handful of cases, and by combining convict records in Australia with the court records in Scotland, I hope to be able to shed some light on the Scottish convict's role in the establishment of the Australian chronicles. Colonies. As I said at the outset, this is a vast topic of which this barely talk, talk barely scratches the surface. But hopefully I've given you some insight into the nature of Scottish court records and how they can be used by historical researchers of all flavours. Thanks for listening, and I'll be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Hello. Uh, the point is now working. So hi, everyone. Yeah, good. Yes. Um, and yeah, hopefully the balance.